mute everybody. As you know, Rick, that means you'll have to go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, but we're going to do that now. So I'm going to keep you all muted. But if you do want to jump in and ask a question, then go ahead and unmute yourself. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that now, but welcome. Good morning. And we're glad you're all here. All right. Can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Wonderful. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, this is uh, when we were, when I was talking to people over the last couple of weeks, uh, this is one of those subjects that has continued to come up amongst partners, which there are a number of on this call, uh, professional colleagues who are other companies that do managed services and such uh, that we work with. Uh, they are also on this call. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here. Those people that are doing managed services are doing it in other parts of the country, but we work with them in developing business process workflow uh, and also just to, uh, to trade secrets. Um, this is a subject matter that seems like it's mutually confusing to a lot of people. Um, it's hard to explain and get your arms around it, <clears throat> at least initially. And today I'm going to hopefully get you in a place where you will understand what it is, why it's important, and also uh, to take one step back to understand that there is a, um, that there's a revolution that is about to take place. Uh, as it relates to this technology. It's probably not going to be as big of a revolution, say, as the internet being introduced, but it will absolutely be as important as internet speeds increasing. Uh, what I'm about to show you is uh, very cool, and uh, it's a little tiny bit technical, but I'm going to do my very best to kind of narrow that gap for you. All right, let me share my screen, and let's, uh, let's see where we go. All right, let me get this uh, gallery back up so that I can see everyone. Wonderful. Can uh, somebody give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Perfect. All right, so here we go. Now, uh, I've had a couple of people who have uh, emailed me in the last 24 hours because they've been uh, dying to know what theme I was going to pick for this week's webinar. As most of you know who have attended previously, there's been a steady stream of movie themes. So, you know, not to disappoint anybody, uh, this week's theme, of course, is going to be Animal House. I figured, why not? Uh, hopefully, we won't run into the problem that we ran into um, two weeks ago when we used Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and there were a number of folks who simply didn't know what that movie was. Um, we felt terrible for them, and uh, we did offer a second session of therapy in order to help them understand the cultural importance of that particular movie. Show of hands, does everybody know what this movie is, please? Dear God. Okay, good. How many of you have watched it more than once? Good. Excellent. All right. Let's dive right in. So a little bit about us. Uh, most of you know who we are, uh, but this tells you just a little bit about Decision Digital and about what it is that we do. I want to tell everybody very quickly who's on this call today. We have uh, customers that we do direct managed services for. Uh, we have vendor partners uh, that are on the call as well. Uh, you may see this uh, dashingly handsome young fellow who's almost in the middle of my screen named Joseph Landis, who's with Nerdio. Uh, we've got a couple of people from Continuum and Neckwise that are in here as well. I think Bob Gensler is in here somewhere. Uh, he can wave to you. So we've got partners that are on the call and we've also got other managed service providers across the country on the call. Uh, these are professional colleagues, Kelly Siegel, Mark Wadnazak, Cheryl Kasner and more. These are all folks that we work with directly where we share business process together. We talk about how we can do things together in order to make our practices better. Um, and so we have a nice little gathering of different types of people. So the reason I'm sharing this is because Decision Digital touches each one of these groups in a very special way. Um, a little advertisement uh, here in about a month, we've got Catapult coming up. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, Catapult is uh, a three-day virtual seminar that we offer, which teaches businesses about business process and workflow. Um, it's, gonna, it's particularly enlightening for many people, especially in the managed service space, to understand how to get predictable results. We switched it during COVID to being uh, virtual. The last one we did was in March, and Alyssa can correct me, I think we had well over 100 attendees. Uh, it was quite extraordinary. 
um, come spend three hours with us in the morning um, and uh, for a couple of days. And I can guarantee you that you'll certainly learn more than you know now about how to run your practice. We'll be glad to help you out. So let's get right into it. Uh, what is Windows Virtual Desktop? Well, you kind of know what it is already. It's a Windows desktop. That's really what it is. Uh, you've been using it for a long, long time. You're very familiar with it. And it's just uh, a different kind of desktop than you were, you're accustomed to using. The difference is, is it doesn't live inside that little box uh, that's on your desk. It lives out there in the cloud. Right? It goes by a couple of different names. Uh, you'll commonly hear it referred to as WVD, which is just a shortening of the name to Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, and it actually hails from, you know, the original place that this actually came from uh, is a service that was developed by Microsoft called Terminal Services many, many years ago. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. And for the sake of the conversation today, you should know that Windows Virtual Desktops come in two delicious flavors. We're going to talk about what the differences are between those in just a minute. So how do we get here? Well, I wasn't originally going to put this timeline in, but I thought it was kind of important to explain to everybody kind of uh, where this came from and why it's really important. Uh, as I said in the previous slide, this actually came from a technology called terminal services. Now, everybody taking a look at the screen can see uh, that was happening 20 years ago. Why is this important? Well. For those of you that are in the managed service space and, and also for the end customers, it's important that you know that this is not a new technology. It is an evolved technology that has been continually getting refined for the last 20 years. Uh, I think it's real important to understand that when we talk about how it needs to be positioned and how we're gonna use it. People have a tendency, as I'm sure Joseph can share with you when he talks to partners, they're like, well, wait a minute, this is new. I don't wanna be the first guy in trying this out. Uh, clearly, it's got all sorts of issues that we need to work through. It's not that way at all. It's not that way at all. It's been around for a long, long time. Microsoft has poured a lot of time and energy and resources to continue to make it better and better and better. Now, as you can follow along here on the timeline, there are some pretty interesting milestones not just the renaming of the product back in 2008, but I wanna draw your attention to what happened in 2010 uh, and 2011. As terminal services kind of turned into remote desktop services, one of the things that Microsoft realized is that the technology is really great, but we have to have a way to enable people to use it uh, in a different way than they may be bringing them into a network and starting to use it at an office building? Is there a place that we can put it, kind of neutral territory, where people can get to it from all different places at all different times? The answer is yes. What Microsoft did is they built this gigantic set of data centers all over the world that's called Microsoft Azure. Uh, workstations, servers, all different types of services live in this cloud offering uh, that they have continued to develop and refine over time. In your minds, think about that as being kind of step two. Step one was the, was the invention and the continued evolution of terminal services to remote desktop. Step two is a neutral place where it needed to live so that people could actually access it, right? Step three, believe it or not, was when Office 365 was born in 2011. I know it doesn't seem like that. It's been almost 10 years that 365 has been around. Why is that relevant to all this? Well, it was Microsoft's way of understanding how they could offer services like this in a subscription model. Instead of you having the capital expense on the front end that you could actually just pay as you go based on the number of licenses and services that you need. So when you take these three things and you combine them together, you start to have a solution that can be made available to a lot of people simultaneously. That's the reason why I'm showing you the timeline is because all these little things in and of themselves may not it may have seemed kind of innocuous but when you put them all together it's the toolbox that was enabling microsoft to actually to deliver these services in the way that we see them now hence we've arrived at this place with windows virtual desktop does that make sense to everybody you can nod your head perfect excellent so to understand this uh, a little bit more you have to really kind of understand the reasons why you need to start thinking about moving away from remote desktop services. The system that we have been using forever and ever in order to connect users into a network environment. 
Most of you are familiar with the way that this works, especially now during COVID, you understand. So what are the differences between the two systems and, and why should we move? Well, there's, there are a lot of reasons, uh, but what I've done is I sifted them down to five, right? Um, understand that the way that remote desktop services works is you set up a server, uh, in some cases a group of servers, in your office, and then people have to make a connection into your office over the internet. That connection has to be secure, right? A virtual private network tunnel, some way to make sure that that information between wherever that user is and the office stays completely secure. Now that used to be, prior to six months ago, that used to only affect probably about 5% of any of our users, right? At any given time, about 5% of the customers that we all serve were accessing networks remotely. Does that sound about right? Now that number is upwards of about 95%. So now all of a sudden we have all these people making VPN connections to firewalls. And they're either trying to get to a desktop that's behind that firewall sitting there so they can do their work, or they're getting to a server that you've set up which gives desktops out to everybody, right? That's the way that the system works. But as most of you know that are on the MSP side, uh, that whole process is wrought with opportunities to break down, right? RDS servers have a tendency to bit a little cranky. Sometimes they lose their certificates. Sometimes they just don't want to answer. Uh, the technology is really, really good, but for whatever reason, there's something standing in the way. Bandwidth, connectivity, uh, equipment superior to operator. There are a lot of reasons why this doesn't work. So the first thing I put up here was, I basically said, hey, there are too many steps. A VPN connection, a remote desktop connection, a wireless connection, that's a lot of connections, right? I think that's too many steps. And I think many of you would agree. Second thing, too expensive. Let's, let's be honest about this. If you wanna set up a remote desktop server, you're gonna to have to have a virtual machine. You're gonna to have to have an operating system license. You're gonna to have to have client access licenses. You're gonna to have to have an astute IT person to actually set all that stuff up, manage it, maintain it, water it, do all the things that need to be done, right? More importantly, you're still kind of perpetuating the madness of continually buying hardware and software, all of which is a capital expense that adds up over time. I have a lot of customers who used to comment, they feel like they work just to enable themselves to worship at the altar of Dell to buy hardware and software every three, four, five years. Uh, and they really understood that that was kind of a necessary evil, but they really just didn't particularly care for it. So it's expensive, right? All right, anybody think that it's confusing to use or even to explain to users? Uh, hold on a second, let me think about this. So you tell me you're gonna give me this, this desktop on top of a desktop. Uh, how am I gonna know which place that I'm supposed to be at any given time? How am I gonna know where any of my information is supposed to be? Uh, is there somebody who's always gonna be there to tell me what's going on? Does this sound vaguely familiar to anybody? I'm sure it does. It only happens with our customers, right? I, I feel certain of that, right? Cheryl, you never run into this. I'm sure nobody else runs into this, right? Um, this is a common complaint, right? Too confusing. And it is too confusing, right? And finally, well, it's just plain different. As good as remote desktop services is, it's a server operating system. It looks similar to Windows 10, but it's not exactly the same thing now, is it? Some things are just in different places. You don't have control over certain settings. Things seem to get lost. All these things, and you're trying to teach your end users, no, it's mostly the thing that you're accustomed to, and oh, please don't shut this down, or don't pull this lever. Uh, and then you have to go through a lot of steps to hide these things from people so that they don't damage the server or do something different. All these kinds of things, right? A lot of two things, right? Two things. But what's really the number one thing? I'll show you. Number one problem, your office. I want everybody to think about this for just a moment. The way that most networking has been done by people like me uh, and most of the other IT folks that are on the call who have been around doing this for 25 years is that we have perpetuated this model of making the office the center of the universe, right? Everything comes into the office. Your users connect into the office. Your remote offices, connect into the main office. You know, Chip, for example, you know, who's on the call with us, he works with a series of banks, right? There's a main location, right? A main branch. And then there are other branches that are all over town, right? They're all connecting in 
to the main branch in order to exchange information, right? This is the way that networking has been done for 25 years, right? And everybody knows what happens when the office is in the center of the wheel, the hub, right? That's the way that networks are designed. What are the things that are the problems? Well, first one, connectivity, right? Either no connectivity or slow connectivity. I know most of you have got redundant internet connections, right? And that works pretty well but that only solves one of the problems. Second problem, power. Can't do anything without it. Some of you that are on the call actually have generators in place and good for you. You're among the few uh, that actually can do it. Many people are in office buildings that either the people that own the buildings will not permit any kind of a generator to be put in, or if they have a generator in place, which some of ours do, they charge an extraordinary amount of money to access it. So power becomes the biggest problem, right? Power goes down, you're dead in the water at your office now, aren't you? There's pretty much no way around it. Uh, and third, the one that you probably don't think about, and I'm looking to everybody's face when I mention this next one, updates. Updates come into servers, updates come into workstations. Machines are supposed to gracefully shut down and reboot, come back up after the updates are in place. But lo and behold, the machines shut down and they're off. And then what happens? Somebody has to roll to that site to restart the server or restart the workstations. In many cases, that's usually not a big deal. In the time that we live in now, some people are simply not allowed to go to their office. Uh, there's no way for them to go there and restart that machine. So what do they do? They call into work sick or, or they call and they say, I can't work. You know, my machine's off at work. I don't have anything I can do. Uh, I guess I'm just going to sit this one out, right? Some of you may find that to be acceptable, I don't. These are the inherent problems when your office is the center of the wheel, the hub, right? And listen, it's our fault. You know, me as a, as a fellow IT guy, this is, this is what we've been teaching people for the last 25 years, right? And the reason we've been teaching them this way because in order to be able to narrow the gap and change that model, it was just far too expensive to do. Uh, I would love for all of my customers to have a generator. I would love for all my customers to have their equipment in the data center. Up until Azure came along, that just simply wasn't economically feasible. Listen, we had a data center in Atlanta for 10 years. We also had one in Dallas, Texas. We had gear stashed in both locations. We had customers who said, please, can you put our servers there so that we can have disaster recovery and business continuity? And we did. And it worked really well, but it was expensive. Expensive so much, in fact, that most people couldn't afford to do it unless they really had a solid business case for doing so. How many of you have run into this same situation that are in the same world that I'm in? Of course you have. It's the same exact situation. We have a solution. It was just expensive, right? So we had to really kind of perpetuate this hub mentality where here's a wheel and the office was the hub in the middle instead of being a spoke, right? Let's talk a little bit about what that looks like and the reality of it, right? The hub method. All right, so check it out. This is you and this is your office in the middle, right? The gray building. And the gears that are running are your network. And everything is moving along exactly the way that it should be moving along, right? Here you've got people working from home, desktops, servers, mobile devices, uh, people working in an office, and maybe a remote site over here, right? Does this look familiar to anybody? All of you that are in IT, raise your hands because this looks, this is daily life, right? This is what networks look like. There we go. So this is great. And this is the way that days are for probably most of us in IT for 99.9% .9 of the time, right? And then what happens? Uh, the network stops for whatever reason, something just stops working. Connectivity, power, updates, you name it. There's a lot of things that could cause this to happen. Now, when that stops or when the connectivity stops, guess what happens next? Everything goes bye-bye, everything. You're dead in the water. You call your customer or the customer calls you and says, power's out at the building. I guess we're just gonna send everybody home. What are we gonna do? Can't work. It seems odd that in, in the year 2020 that we can't have a better method, right? Well, we do. Now with Windows Virtual Desktop and Azure, I'm gonna introduce you to something called the spoke method. This is the spoke method. Same kind of idea, just designed slightly different, right? So in the middle is the Microsoft data center, right? That's what's in the middle. 
this look familiar? Well, here's your, here's your people working from home, your desktops, your mobile devices, people working you know, in the office. Here's your office over here now, and here's your remote office. Now, if you can imagine for a second, imagine at the center of this is the center of a wheel, the hub, and that each one of these places is a spoke, right? Everybody knows what a wheel looks like. They're just lines coming off spokes, right? Now, same scenario. What happens if you lose power? What happens if you lose connectivity? Any of those things? Well, here's your office, loses connectivity, loses power. And what happens? Well, it drops off. But guess what? Everything else stays running. Your users can still operate. Your line of business applications are still processing information. Uh, people that are working from home can still get in. Your remote office that's in another city hasn't even been affected. This is the spoke methodology. This is the direction that we as IT people are starting to move our customers in. Here's a little secret. This technology, this whole idea of this spoke method, it's not new. It's been around for 40 years. The difference is, is that we just didn't have the ability to make this cost effective before. I mean, who in their right mind was gonna stick their entire network inside of a data center and have everybody accessing it remotely when it was gonna cost 30 or $40,000 a month? There's just no way that you could make that work. Now you can, because we have Azure and Windows Virtual Desktop. Pretty cool, huh? Everybody understand the difference between the hub method and the spoke method? Does it make sense when you look at it this way? Yeah, I'm looking for some thumbs up. Excellent, good. When you look at it this way, now you can start to get an understanding of why this is becoming so important to everybody. So how do we get there? Well. First thing you need to know is you need to know what the different flavors are for Windows Virtual Desktop. There are really, I said that there are two flavors, but the reality of it is there are three, right? One is called a pooled desktop. One is called a personal desktop. And then wait for it, one is called no desktop, right? We're gonna get to that in a second. But for the sake of the conversation, you should really focus on the first two. Now, let me share something with you. I have heard uh, numerous presentations uh, from all different people about uh, the, the differences between these types of desktops, right? Um, I've been in different sessions with Joseph and his team. Uh, I've been in different conversations with all many different folks on this call. And I have heard 50 different ways for people to try to explain the differences between these. Now, originally, when I was going to talk about this, I was going to show you a picture of a pool full of people. But that really, in this, in this particular time, well that, that, well, that just doesn't send the right social distancing message. So I really didn't feel like I could put that out there for anybody. Um, so instead, what I've done is I've come up with a little bit of a different way to explain how these two things actually work. I think that everybody will get the idea. And, and really, what better way to explain complex IT things uh, than food, right? I mean, after all, why not? Let's talk about food, right? I'm sorry that I'm gonna make some of you hungry right now. Let me tell you what the difference is between these two types of desktops. A pooled desktop, I want you to think of this kind of like a loaf of bread. You buy a loaf of bread in the store and it comes in a bag, right? And a loaf of bread can be sliced up into 20 slices. So you can get 10 sandwiches kind of out of one loaf of bread, right? And if you need more sandwiches, anybody guess what you need to do? Well, you have to buy another loaf of bread, right? So, but this is one loaf that comes in one bag, and then you're dividing it up so that people can have sandwiches. Now, here's the deal. Uh, when you make sandwiches from a loaf of bread, now, just for the record, uh, I'm from the South. Uh, a sandwich is two pieces of bread, just so everybody knows. Uh, if you think that a sandwich is made from one piece of bread, uh, that's a half a sandwich. That's something completely different, and any self-respecting Southerner would never call that a sandwich. That is a half a sandwich, just to set the record straight. Uh, so my Southerners on the phone are probably gonna give me a thumbs up in just a second and tell me, yes, the man is right. So each person can get two slices of bread and they can make a sandwich, right? And everybody's got their own individual sandwich, right? And you can make the sandwich with whatever meats that I have presented here, right? In this case, we've got turkey and ham. You can choose just turkey, you can choose just ham, or you can mix the two of them together to your heart's content. Uh, 
You can make whatever kind of sandwich you want as long as you choose from those particular meats. And then of course you can dress the sandwich with whatever condiments that you want, all right? Everybody can understand what this means, right? Now here's the thing. If, if I make a sandwich for Brad and I make a sandwich for Kelly and I make a sandwich for Bob, uh, they're not sharing the sandwiches among each other. No, they have their own individual sandwiches the way that they want them, right? Anybody getting hungry? I know I am. So how does this relate to Windows Virtual Desktop, the pooled desktop? Well, the pooled desktop server is nothing more than a really, really powerful workstation that's being divided up amongst multiple users at the same time. So the pooled desktop server is the loaf of bread. The individual user desktops are the sandwiches, right? So we're taking one large machine and we're splitting it up, let's say 10 times, one desktop for each person. Just like if I give each one of you a sandwich, it's your own individual sandwich, right? Okay, well, you can understand that. So the, the, app, the applications that are running on that server, well, they're like the meats. Remember I said, you can mix and match whatever you want, turkey, ham, together. You can have whatever you like. It's entirely up to you, but you only get to choose from the meats that I've given you. In a pool desktop environment, one of the advantages that we have as IT people is that we can preload applications on there and only allow the users to access the applications that we want. We can actually keep them from installing other applications. In fact, if Mark came along inside of, you know, and took his sandwich and decided to look around both ways and then slap a piece of cheese on there, uh, and close up the sandwich and then walk away for just a few minutes and come back, guess what? The cheese would just magically disappear. That's the way virtual desktop works. In Mark's particular case, if he installed another application in his desktop and he logged out and went to lunch and came back, the application would go away because we're imposing a level of control. Now, I want everybody to think about that for just a minute. How cool would it be, especially you IT folks, who have had this great white buffalo running around in your mind forever, wouldn't it be great if I could set up a desktop that had only the applications that my users really needed, either for a department or across the board, and that I could keep them from actually installing other stuff that they simply don't need or run the potential of infecting the machine, right? A consistent user experience all the way down the line. I mean, all of us that are in IT, that's, that's like seeing a unicorn. It's something we've always wanted. It's just something that we really haven't been able to do unless we did very complicated things on the back end of the network, and it was a bear to keep up with it. With Windows Virtual Desktop, I can control that experience entirely for the users. It's almost like the Apple methodology of using an iPhone, right? You have a limited number of choices, and as long as you use our choices, everything in the world will be just fine, right? These are not the droids that you are looking for. Simple as that. So. Back to the food. The condiments, well, those are the personalization things that you do to your desktop. You want your own background, you want your own shortcuts, maybe your own colors. You can dress that up however you choose. And that is not something that we necessarily push down or change in WVD. We want people to have a little bit of personalization because it makes them feel good. Hence, Brad might like ketchup and mustard on his sandwich. Kelly may be somebody that just likes oil and vinegar. You get the idea. You could choose whatever condiments that you want. So the pooled desktops really match up really nicely to looking at a loaf of bread, single loaf of bread that's been sliced up and shared amongst a number of people. Make sense? Pretty cool idea, right? All right, so what's the difference with a personal desktop? Well, as you kind of guessed it, it's basically one loaf of bread that's been cut in half, right? One big sandwich. Now, some of you may prefer to have a big sandwich, right? I get it. I totally get it. One big sandwich. And at this particular stage, you can see that you can choose from a lot of different kind of meat that you put on that sandwich. Why? Because when you're dealing with a personal desktop, you're kind of surrendering control back to a user. Here's the way that you can set your desktop up. It's yours. Go set it up as you please. Set it up how you want. Customize it however you want, install your own applications, do whatever it is you want. Well, you know, in the bread methodology, which I'm proposing here, that's basically one loaf of bread that you've given to somebody. They've cut it and have to make a gigantic sandwich that they own. That's it, right? Now, what are the applications? Why would somebody need uh, one sandwich versus being able to take one sandwich and then share it? Well, they're really hungry. Uh, that's not really the reason. The real reason is, is because in the world that we all live in right now, in terms of computing, 
some of the applications that we use under computers, well, they need more resources, right? I want you to think of things like uh, computer-aided design programs, uh, legal documents that are two, 3,000 pages long, things that consume a lot of CPU resources, right? When you put somebody uh, that's a really, really intense user with those type of graphically intense applications, they can start to max out the resources in that pool desktop. Uh, so it's better to actually give them their own dedicated desktop so they can have all the speed that they need to do the work that they need to do. That balance between users typically is about uh, probably, I'm looking to Frank, that's probably about a 90-10 split or maybe a 95-5 split is what we've typically seen. About 5% of the users because of heavy stuff that they do really need their own dedicated desktop. Whereas everybody else can work in a pooled environment uh, and everything works fine. The real nice thing about working in the pooled environment is that economies of scale start to take place. It becomes less expensive to support more users. And there's a really cool feature that's inside of Windows Virtual Desktop, which is called auto scaling. And basically, as more and more people kind of want sandwiches, you can just go and add other loaves of sandwiches almost dynamically. So more people come in. You need more server resources. You don't have to tell Microsoft to carve out another server. It does it for you automatically. And when users start to die off during the course of the day, I shouldn't say die off, when they stop using the system, the Microsoft system is smart enough to scale back so that you're not paying for resources that you don't need. So think about that. Uh, you walk in in the morning. You may have 30 users that need to have access. Two loaves of bread get presented, right? As the day goes on, it gets to be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Some users leave, they move away. Well, automatically we just shrink back down. It's kind of nice because it really keeps your cost under control. So the moral of the story is, well, if you're using a pool desktop, you have a lower CPS. CPS, cost per sandwich is what that means, right? So your cost per user is definitely lower. If you have one big sandwich, well, you're gonna expect that you're gonna pay more money because it's one big sandwich with a lot of meat you're going to have a higher cost per sandwich, right? That's the difference between pooled and personal. Pretty simple to understand when you look at it from the sandwich point of view. Uh, that's how it kind of works all together. Does that make sense? Anybody hungry? I'm getting a lot of people saying they're hungry. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Now, a little bit more information. So really, what are the things that kind of set it apart? Well, I like to call these awesome features, right? Availability. Well, when you start to kind of move in that direction of having that spoke methodology, right? Where the virtual desktop's in the middle and everybody can access it. Now think about the world we live in now. We're, we're now in this place where many people are gonna be telecommuting all the time. We have to make sure that that experience that they have from a user perspective is dead on to whatever they experience inside of the, the binds of the office, right? When you're using Windows Virtual Desktop, if you're in the office, if you're remote, uh, if you're on a boat somewhere, the experience is identical because the desktop follows you around no matter where you go, no matter what method you use. And the connectivity is really, really fast. You get gigabit connectivity inbound to the Microsoft network. That's awesome. In many cases, that's faster than what you typically have at an office. You can connect with a Mac, you can connect with a PC, a tablet, pretty much any method that you wish to connect you can connect to a Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop, which is nice. Those of you that are Mac users, which I know of you, a couple of you on the call now, you can connect right in without any kind of a problem. So it narrows the gap of compatibility, which I really, really like. Second thing I love, controllability. I talked about having that consistent desktop across all of your users. I can set up a desktop template for HR. I can set up a desktop template for accounting. I can set up a desktop for management. And I can mix and match the programs and things that are in each one of those in order to give that user a, a nice, clearly defined experience. The other thing about this, which I think is super cool, is an example of, let's just say that Kevin comes to work for me on Monday of next week. I need to get Kevin to desktop. Well. Right now, Dell's lead time on delivering desktops is running about 14 days. Well, Kevin has a really, really go get a mentality and he wants to start working right away. Guess what I can do? In about two mouse clicks, I can create a Windows Virtual Desktop with all the software that Kevin needs to start working. And Kevin can start working from his home PC. 
as if he was sitting in the office. And we can wait for that machine to arrive from Dell and be able to be deployed. It takes just a matter of minutes to roll them out. Let me tell you what I don't have to do with Kevin. Uh, I don't have to install all the applications on this machine. I don't have to go through that endless series of Windows updates that always happen. Uh, I don't have to join him into the domain. I don't have to do all these things. Why? Because that's already part of the template. And let's say that Kevin starts working on it day one, and by accident, he clicks on something and his machine gets infected. Piece of malware rolls in because he clicked on a link for a free soda that came in an email. I know Kevin would never do that, right? So he clicks on the link for the free soda. His machine gets malware. Well, all of a sudden, he calls and says, I've messed up. Something's wrong. Uh, I'm going to have to rebuild my machine. Great. Frank gets the call. All that Frank has to do is go out to Windows Virtual Desktop press a button, and it will completely refresh Kevin's image in a matter of minutes without going through a full restage. Imagine how much time we just saved, the hours and hours of time we would have had to go through in order to get things back to where Kevin needed to be. Not any longer. It really becomes that easy. These are called golden images. We maintain a series of them for different customers depending on what their needs are. But it becomes that quick to be able to roll it out, right? I love that. Uh, I also. I also love the ability to actually keep people from installing things that really we don't wish to have installed, right? So controllability, a big thing, right? Scalability, ah, uh, this is my favorite. Bye-bye servers and workstations. I made an announcement to my crew two months ago uh, that Frank and Alyssa and some of the other people with Decision Digital that are on the call, I made an announcement that the company has bought his last server. We're not buying any more servers. We don't need to. How many of you can say that right now? I don't see any hands. You can. We did. Imagine what would happen if all of you, just take a moment and think about the fact if you didn't have to buy servers any longer. What kind of capital expense you would shed if you didn't have to do that? It's pretty amazing. All of you right now that are using networks are paying for servers to sit in a server room, workstations to sit on desks, and they're getting used eight hours a day right? The rest of the time they're sitting there idle, capturing updates, doing different things, all that kind of stuff. You're paying for them running. They're just sitting there idle and you've had to invest in them. Here's the other thing that you've had to do. You've had to overstock them with memory, overstock them with storage. Why? Because you have to anticipate what's going to happen over a five-year period, right? How much am I going to need storage-wise five years from now? How much memory am I going to need? You have to overbuy right now to make sure well, I got to make sure that I don't have to go back to somebody like Steve or Kelly or anybody else and say, oh, listen, we bought these servers three years ago and now we're running out of dry space. You know, I'm a fool because I wasn't thinking enough to tell you that you were going to need more space. Now we have to go buy more, right? Nobody in IT ever wants to really be in that position. So what we have to do is we have to overestimate exactly what we need to keep the customer kind of ahead of the curve and get a five-year lifespan out of that server. Does this sound familiar to anybody in IT on the call? Of course it does. This is just the way of the world. It's the way things have been. When you start looking at Windows Virtual Desktop, that goes away. You reserve the resources that you need. And as time goes by and you need more resources, you click a button, you add more memory, you add more storage, you add more CPUs. You scale up as you need versus buying things on the front end. And you do that as you go. So no more having to stock up on hardware waiting for things to grow. That capital expense goes completely away and now you're replacing capital expense with operating expense. So now you stop doing this with your IT budget and you start doing this. You now get something that everybody wants and that's predictable spending. This is the place that you're starting to arrive at. So when I talk about scalability, you're not confined in a server case. You're not beholden to the, the hardware vendors to buy anything, not at all. Last but certainly not least, economy. Well, this kind of goes hand in hand with scalability. You kind of get out of the server procurement business, but the last line on here is, is one that I think will get everybody's attention. Look at home PCs and say, I don't care. So a lot of us right now that are in the IT side of things have done something that we would never, ever, ever do under normal conditions, ever. We have allowed home PCs to make connections to corporate networks. We've had to. 
That's just what's happened with COVID. How many people have done this? We have. Raise your hands. This is a safe place, right? We've had to do this because of what's happened with COVID. And all of us that are in IT have lost sleep over it because we understand the inherent risk that is posed by this. Viruses, updates. The number that we saw with our customers was north of 70% of the machines that we brought in remotely when we got on them for the first time either had no antivirus, expired antivirus, 70%. And they're home PCs, right? I don't want to support home PCs. None of you in IT want to. There's no way that someone's going to allow us to charge $180 an hour to work on a $75 Linksys access point. Ain't going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. So what do you do? The new world order kind of calls for people are going to be working remote all the time. Well, you have a couple of choices. Either you can convince the company to go out there and have a capital expense of buying laptops for every single user that they've got abandoning the desktops that they already bought, I don't know, a year ago from you, it's probably not going to bode too well. Or you can introduce them to the idea of Windows Virtual Desktop and they can use their home PC. They can use their Mac. They can use whatever device that they've already got and they can run the wheels out of it, right? And you don't have to worry about managing and maintaining that device because if they access Windows Virtual Desktop from that home machine, you don't care. It doesn't have any effect on whatever you're doing. So they have a terminal that they can get into this corporate environment. They can infect you. They're not gonna transfer information up the line. They're gonna have faster speed than they ever were. You're not gonna have to maintain that machine for them. You just don't have to care about it. And you eliminate a really huge security risk that all of us in IT have right now, that home machine that's not being properly managed connecting into a corporate environment. Run the wheels off of it, who cares? You don't have to buy a machine for them, let them use their machine. They can, it works perfectly fine. So when I talk about economy, that last point is one of the ones that kind of resonates in my mind because I look now at all the machines that we support and I'm starting to really come to grips with the reality with a lot of people and sharing it with our customers, some of whom are on this call. But the fact of we're now in a place where we have to do something. This is the new new, what are we gonna do? Are you gonna buy laptops for everybody? I don't think so let's talk about Windows Virtual Desktop and change the way that networking is going to be done, right? So where do we go? Well, our aim is to get people into hybrid networks, a combined technology. Look, the cloud stuff that's out there can't do everything 100% of the time, and I think everybody knows that, but it can do a lot. And as time goes by, it continues to morph and evolve. So step by step by step, you start to introduce these concepts. We are introducing them to our customers. You can introduce them to yours uh, in a way that they can actually swallow and understand. So what does that look like? Well, you know, you can, you can kind of sit here like this and just do nothing, right? You can do absolutely nothing and leave things exactly the way that they are, uh, and you're going to get pummeled. Because as I shared with you, this is a change in the way things are going to be done. Uh, and if you're not exploring this now and really getting into it, you're going to find that you're going to be not only left behind, but customers will walk away because they're going to learn about this technology from somebody else. And they're going to say, well, not only should we be doing this, why didn't you tell me about it? We, this, this is a no brainer for us. Do you know how, how much time and energy and effort we spend on people crashing their laptops and having to rebuild them and do all these things, dropping them when they travel, all those things. So you can do nothing and you will be. 0.0. Well, let's get a little warmer. All right, well, we can start taking all the servers that you have at your office and we can tell them to start to synchronize to Azure. All right, this is called Azure Site Recovery. Pretty easy to do. If you've got Hyper-V, Windows Virtual Machines, you set the system up and here's what's cool about it. You set this thing up and it makes real-time copies of all the servers at a customer site right up into the Azure cloud and it does it every five minutes. Just copies them bit by bit over the line. It just does it all by itself automatically. If the building loses power, there's a connectivity issue, you can actually start those machines up in Azure and the customer's back in business. They can just connect in and start working. This used to be something that was tens of thousands of dollars in expense. It's not any longer. It's not. 
it's in reach for every single customer that we've got, every single customer that you've got. In fact, it's a no brainer. We're rolling this out to all of our customers right now because it's so important to us and it will be important to them. It's easy to do, really, really easy to do. All right, let's keep going. Step two. Okay, so now we have this kind of combination. We've got some of our servers that are up in Azure, some of our servers that are on-premise. Customers are starting to get actually an affinity for this, feeling comfortable with it. Wow, it actually works. It's actually really fast. It does some cool things. We are in a place now where something happens to the building, a weather event, anything else. Can't go in the office because it's infected. People can work. I love that. Business keeps moving on, right? We also start doing a little bit of a proof of concept with Windows Virtual Desktop. What are the applications that we have that we can actually put into a Windows Virtual Desktop and let people start to test drive them? I'll give you a couple of ideas. QuickBooks, Sage, Tigerpaw, uh, Dynamics. There are a whole bunch of these applications that you can just put those applications there and people can start accessing through Windows Virtual Desktop. And if they don't want that whole virtual desktop experience, right, that whole big desktop on top of a desktop that's confusing, well, then you can just give them a shortcut for something called a remote app. Do you remember a few slides back when I showed you that third bucket that said no desktop? I can actually install, listen to this, I can install QuickBooks in a Windows Virtual Desktop, and I can create an icon, and I can hand it off to Joe. Joe downloads it and puts it on his desktop at his office, right? He has no connection to Azure, nothing. He just, I'm giving him this, this shortcut that he drops on his desktop. Joe clicks on it and it launches and oh, lo and behold, QuickBooks comes up on his screen, right? Joe starts using QuickBooks, putting information in, making changes, doing the things that he did. Joe calls me up and he says, hey, I need to know how you got my password to get on my machine and install QuickBooks without me knowing it. That's what Joe's gonna tell me. And my answer to Joe is gonna be, I did no such thing. Well, you had to because QuickBooks is running on my machine right now. Nope, that's a remote app. You're actually, when you click on that, it's running QuickBooks in Windows Virtual Desktop. It's just giving you a borderless window to run it in. You will swear that that application is installed on your machine. Windows Virtual Desktop and Remote App is that good where you can't even tell that it's a remote app. You can't. Joe, anyone else would swear that you installed that software on their machine, but it's not. It's, it's running over there. So for some people who just don't want to move completely into a Windows Virtual Desktop, it's cool. Let's take some of those line of business applications. Let's install them and then give the shortcut to them and let them start running it. They run it for a couple of weeks. They see it runs really fast. And all of a sudden you come back to them and say, you've been running in Windows Virtual Desktop and you don't even know it. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. That's what happens. Proof of concept to show that the technology works. And then of course, the ultimate with this is that you really get to a point of being completely bulletproof, right? Your servers are in Azure. You may have one server on site that's really functioning as a backup authentication device, maybe a print server, but your users are now using Windows Virtual Desktops for everything that they do. If they're telecommuting three days a week, their experience at home is exactly the same as it is in their office. All the way through and through, it's right where you want it to be. It's not a hard thing to do, it just takes time to go through it. Well, I hope this has given you kind of an understanding of how it works the direction that it's going. Uh, I promise you uh, that this is going to uh, widely impact all of your organizations, whether you're a partner of ours, uh, whether you're an end customer of ours, uh, this is the direction that everything is starting to go. Uh, and it is gonna be here and it's gonna change the way that you do computing. It's gonna change the way you think about networking. Uh, but it's just like anything else, one step at a time, you move into this don't go in whole hog. Uh, we've got a thriving business practice at Decision Digital of getting people set up in Azure and Windows Virtual Desktop. Believe it or not, the vast majority of these customers come to us because what they did is they took their existing network that they had at their office and they made a carbon copy of that inside of Azure. And they come to us because it doesn't work. They, they're scratching their head saying, well, wait a minute, what, I, I copied exactly what I have 
in Azure, but it's not working. In fact, it works terrible. Uh, we did this proof of concept and everybody's throwing their hands up saying it's awful. How is it not working? Because networking in Azure is different. You have to walk through it in a very different way. You have to look at networking in a very different way. It's not pound for pound a lateral move from your on-premise network to Azure. There are a lot more things to think about. The majority of the customers that are coming to us are having us come unscrew them with what they've done in Azure and get them back to the place that they need to be. So I'm offering this to you all as a cautionary tale of don't just jump into Azure when your customers thinking that if they have five servers at their office, you're going to build the exact same servers in Azure and that everything is going to be right with the world. It's not going to be. It's not. It takes more thought and more planning. Um, move through it piece by piece in order to get them acclimated and then it will come and you will be happy. And if you need help with it, we're here for you. We have a lot of expertise here and we're glad to share it as many of you know in the call uh, that we work with directly on this. With that, I will turn it back over to Alyssa to unmute everyone and uh, see if you have questions. And we have, she has to unmute herself. Everyone but me is unmuted. Uh, right. You all have the ability to unmute yourself now and, um, or you should all be unmuted now. So watch what you say. Uh, so <laughs> a couple of questions that have been brought up. So uh, Corbin wants to know if he moved to the personal instead of the pool Will he get to use SQL Management Studio to connect to SQL? Yes. Yes. One of the big differences when you move to a personal desktop is that a lot of control for installing applications reverts back to the user. So whatever software they wish to install and operate with, they certainly can. And uh, what about the move from Cloud Jumper to Azure? Is, it, is Azure better than Cloud Jumper? Uh, it is in, in the way that the technology works uh, on many, many levels. It absolutely is. Uh, Cloud Jumper really kind of started off its life uh, and in many ways is still rooted in, in Microsoft remote desktop services. Uh, it doesn't have the flexibility of control. It doesn't have the ability with golden images the way that uh, Windows Virtual Desktop does. Um, we, we're finding that a lot of people are moving away from Cloud Jumper and into WVD because of reliability, dependability, scalability, all those reasons. It's, it's a really, it, we have a number of customers that have asked us to move them. Uh, so yes, there are huge advantages to doing so. And I know that there are a couple of people that are on this call right now who've actually made that move. Uh, and, and it's gone very positively for them. Those are all the questions that I have on, uh, in the chat. So Rick. Yeah. So in doing that move, is it a lot easier than going from the network? So if you're in Cloud Jumper going to Azure, it's a lot easier doing that um, than it is from the network to Azure, or do you see a lot of problems? Um, it's, I don't know that, I think if you, I don't see a lot of problems in doing it, Cheryl. Um, I think much of it really depends on, much of it depends on what you're gonna be moving in. I'm a, one of the things that I really like about Azure is because it's a Microsoft product and it speaks Microsoft, right? Um, one of the simplest ways that you can do things if you choose is you can just tell your on-premise network to synchronize all of your servers up into Azure and it's all built into Hyper-V. So you can literally tell it to replicate. It copies them over into Azure and then you can just fail over adjusting the, you know, adjusting different settings and such as they relate to Azure. It becomes really easy in that aspect to really make the, make the jump, if you can forgive the pun. Um, it's really easy to do it that way. Um, from going from Cloud Jumper to Azure, not difficult to do at all, but not quite as easy because in the first example, you have full control over the containers. You have full control over the virtual hard drives. You have full control over all those things. Where with Cloud Jumper, you have a lot of control, but you don't have full control to get to that level kind of behind the scenes with the hypervisor and the other stuff. You know what I mean? What happens with a lot of people with Cloud Jumper is what they do instead is they'll set up, they'll, they'll build a house right next to their old house. And then they'll move all their furniture and everything from one house into the other, which generally takes longer to do, right? You get a clean environment, 
it's the whole expense and the time of moving everything from one place to the other, uh, which becomes problematic for some folks. With, with moving directly from on-premise to Azure, um, you can literally set up the replication to happen. And if the replication takes a week, it doesn't matter. It's not affecting anybody. And then I can pick a day and say, I'm failing you over to Azure Friday afternoon at six o'clock. I fail you over. Everything is there. The server names are the same. The IP addresses are the same. All that stuff is the same. And then you can start to tweak and tune and adjust things to the level that they're more Azure friendly. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's the way that's, and, and we have some customers that actually just tell us that instead that they want us just to build it up from scratch and then move stuff over. Most of the people that we find that want us to do that are ones that say, started off in Windows, say in 2000, 2003, 2008. They've continued to upgrade, upgrade, upgrade as time has gone by. Their networks are stable, but in the back of their mind, they're like, you know, probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have a fresh start you know, clean installs of operating systems. So we'll join those into their existing domain, give them a fresh start, migrate their data over, and we kind of restart the clock that way. Um, some people we do that with, some people need that done because their directories are just a mess. Uh, but you run into the same kind of people that we do in, in the aspect of that, you know who those are. Uh, but that's the, that's the way to kind of tackle it. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions or you just all can't wait to get off the session to eat? <laughs> I'm ready for a sandwich. See, I'm sure. I'm sure. Definitely. You send us all sandwiches, right? Uh, you know, they're going to be emailed to you shortly. Uh, <laughs> I had gloves on when I made them. Uh, so just so that everybody knows. Uh, well, wonderful. Uh, if, if there are no other questions, then you know, we'll certainly be following up in the next day or two with some additional information. Uh, if you need help or you think of something afterwards, please just reach out to us and ask us. Uh, we'll be glad to share more information with you or tell you anything that you need to know. Uh, it's, uh, it's a super cool technology. Uh, and I think that if you start to embrace it, you're going to really find that it's going to change the way that a lot of your networking stuff actually works. Uh, we're glad to help you if you have that information that you want to have answered. Just reach out and, uh, and we're here for you. Uh, until, until then, I will tell everybody, please stay in good health and stay safe. Uh, and if there's anything that you wish for us to do, we're just an email or phone call away. It's nice to see you all. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank Greg. you. Thank it you. is my pleasure.